Well, it is nice to be back together. Um, we did do this, somebody asked me, did you do this event last year? And the answer is yes. I think we had about 40 people show up, but we had a lot of people. And we had such great success with that that we are streaming online again this year. There are still some people that shouldn't be in public settings or are uncomfortable or have a loved one at home who may be uh, is, uh, immune system compromise and so we have people that are online streaming so if you're watching online thank you for joining us today hopefully you'll find this worth your time um, and the content uh, thought-provoking and hopefully help answer some questions but get you to ask some different questions when you go back to your work or to your office um, later this week so Gonna have a great day out on the golf course. Those of you who are playing golf, uh, the shoes got here a little late, uh, but anybody that's playing golf today, we have a brand new pair of Skechers golf shoes out there for you. So sometime between now and 11 o'clock, when we have the break, stop and get fitted for your pair of shoes. Um, if they don't have your size, John will take your information and uh, we'll get those mailed out to you or delivered to you for that. So anyway, thank you for being here. Um, those of you I haven't met, I'm Larry Gentry. I'm the president and CEO of C-Store. This is our 14th annual leadership summit. Um, started in 07 was our first year that we did this and it's really grown since then. And we thank you for coming out. Um, we know that the one commodity that all of us have a limited quantity of is time. And the fact that you chose to spend a day or a half a day with us really means a lot and we appreciate it. And hopefully we'll make this day and this time that you spend with us very worthwhile. We couldn't do this event without our sponsors. Um, NetApp, Rubrik, you can see all the rest of them there. NetApp has been a sponsor every year since year one, and the only one that I can say that about. So thank you, NetApp, I wanna give them a little hand. Thank you for always stepping up. We've got a lot of new partners, particularly in our cyberspace in the last five or six years, as the world is, uh, we're gonna find out today, gotten really tough. The bad guys always seem to be two steps ahead of us. And so we have a ton of uh, cybersecurity sponsors here today. They're out there in, in the uh, hallway. Make sure you stop by and talk to them. And if you are struggling with that, like a lot of our clients are, we'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, today's agenda, I'm not gonna read it. You'll see it in your brochure there as well. Uh, we've got a great keynote speak, a, a speaker in Peter Leiden. We'll introduce him in a minute here. Uh, we're also gonna have some presentations from NetApp and Rubrik, and they're really not gonna talk to you much about product. They're really gonna to talk to you about what they're seeing in the world and hopefully some of the experiences they've had and how you might be able to learn from that and some things you could do differently or do better. We're gonna try and get out of here at 11.20. I always say that every year and then it's like 11.30 by the time we get out of here. Uh, we will head over to the uh, TPC uh, about 12 o'clock, 12.30, uh, shotgun start. So you're gonna get about a half hour, 45 minutes to warm up. Um, they will have lunch over there for everybody that's sticking around and playing golf and then afterwards, whether you're playing golf or not, you're welcome to join us on the uh, patio at the Toro Lounge there for a happy hour afterwards. So, anybody notice there was a booth out there for the Alzheimer's Association today? Anybody go, what the heck is that doing here in a technology conference? Well, first of all, the reason it's here is I'm a board member and have been with the Alzheimer's Association for 13 years. And I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes making you aware of the organization and the resources that it has. Whether you might need it, whether somebody in your family might need it, some friend might need it, you will know that there's resources out there for you and you won't have to walk that journey alone. So the Alzheimer's Association, which I've been a, a volunteer with for a long period of time, um, is the world's leading organization when it comes to Alzheimer's care and research. And their vision is a world without Alzheimer's and other related dementias. And we use the term Alzheimer's because it's, it's the most common name. That we, there's Lewy body, there's vascular dementia, there's all kinds of dementia. But our vision is to create a world without Alzheimer's. I want to give you some facts. The state we live in today, Arizona, is the state that is growing the fastest with the number of people being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Not a little bit of a surprise there. Lots of people like to retire here. They move here, and, but we are growing faster. Number one, it's not something we want to be number one in, right? Also, Arizona currently has the highest percentage of people in the United States that are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So not only are we the highest, we're growing the fastest. The epidemic is right here, it's centered in Arizona. This organization is dedicated to supporting that, right? Currently, there's about 175,000 people in the state of Arizona 
that have Alzheimer's and other dementia are living with that disease. And that means there's 175,000 families that are out there trying to figure out how to care for that person and making really some of the toughest decisions they'll ever make in their life. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, I'm really proud to say this, we are the largest private funder of research for Alzheimer's and dementia in the world. And third, only overall behind the US government and the Chinese government. When I tell people that, they're kind of surprised. The Chinese government, this disease doesn't care what your ethnicity is. It doesn't care what part of the world you live in. It's affecting everybody. And there is a race to figure out how can we find a way to slow this down, cure it, or prevent it, right? When you stop by the booth at one of the breaks out there, pick up one of the 800 card numbers, right? One of the things that the Alzheimer's Association does, we have 24 by seven by 365 support helpline. When you need help, when you get the diagnosis, when it's two o'clock in the morning, you need some answers. And there are trained master degree social workers in over 200 languages. So when somebody needs some help, when they get that diagnosis, we wanna be there and step in and walk that journey with you. All of the programs that are provided by the Alzheimer's Association are free, 100%. Everything is free and they're dedicated to care and support at the same time funding research so that we can find a way to end up with a world without Alzheimer's. So that's why they're here today and partly it's a passionate cause of mine as well, but I didn't want anybody to not have the resources that they might need for their family or for their friends. So there's some cards on your table. Uh, we're gonna have a panel discussion later. If there's some questions that you'd like to ask that panel, if you will write them out and drop them off um, at one of the breaks out to the table out front, we'll sure include those in the questions for the panel later. So at C-Store, we believe we put people on a path to success. We want to help put you on a path to success today. Today, we hope that, you know, we have some fun, right? We hope we get to spend some time together. It's nice to get back together. We hope we educate you a little bit. We hope we inform you. Um, we'll give you some ideas on how to keep your data protected that the bad guys are always trying to get from you. Um, we'll hopefully enable you to continue to grow in your cybersecurity presence and strategies so that your company is never in the news. It's the worst thing a CEO wants. I don't want to be on the front page of the paper. Please, 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 please. We don't want to be that. We want to help you with that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for spending some time with us. Hopefully you'll find the content uh, thought-provoking, uh, engaging, and our, our strategy every year is to try and find a way to get you information that you might not otherwise have an uh, opportunity to hear. So with that, I want to introduce um, our keynote speaker, Peter Leiden. Um, Peter is a really interesting guy. I've gotten to talk to him a couple times. He's, he's a leading expert on megatrends and new technology, which I kind of think is what we all want to know. Where the hell is the world going? And how do I get there, right? Um, he's a leading expert on technology and what's gonna come in the future. He's a serial entrepreneur, right? He's been doing this a long time, lots of different, uh, his background is just is fascinating, right? He's worked for several pioneering organizations uh, that followed the disruption of the digital revolution. And he's helped to kind of reinvent some of those fields, particularly in media, business, and politics in his career. Um, Peter's also a wonderful storyteller, and you're gonna find that out today, right? Um, weaving in the big picture, right? Along with what's going on today, right? And that's where we, I think we all struggle, right? His range of experiences make him the perfect person to kind of tell that comprehensive story that we're all trying to figure out what looks like for us in the future. He was the managing editor of the original Wired magazine, right? And he's worked in Silicon Valley for over 20 years. So he knows all about new technologies, and that's kind of how he's wired, right? He knows, he also was uh, the founder of the Business reInvent, which was a startup group that worked with video gathering top innovators from around the world in virtual roundtables to discuss how can we reinvent our world, right? Versus just kind of sit back and let it happen to us. He knows about future trends. Uh, he worked, he's worked at Global Business Network, which is a renowned think tank that has helped corporations plan for the future. So he's helped companies try and do what you guys are all trying to do. He was the founding director of New Politics Institute that helped those in Washington start to understand and transition to the new way of doing politics, which is on the internet, right? And so he knows about politics and government. He knows China and the world, having worked as a special correspondent in Asia uh, for Newsweek magazine, and he's traveled to more than 50 countries as part of that role. And he's also authored two books. I don't know where the heck he found the time, right? Um, and those two books are about the future called The Long Boom and what's next. So with that, let's give a warm welcome to Peter Leiden.
No, I got, I got my own clicker. Thanks, though. Wow. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it, may, it might make you think, hey, does, can this guy hold a job? He keeps moving around all the time. It's like, no, I'm just actually one of those people. I actually literally one of those people that I spent about five years on something just totally focused, and then I kind of want to move on to something else. And in fact, uh, so that career that he said has allowed me to actually touch down on all kinds of different uh, spaces and learn a lot about the world in a kind of more comprehensive way. And in fact, what he didn't include, of course, was with this pandemic, I'm kind of on to another thing. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about today is based on my work since the pandemic here, in which I've been um, advised, one of the things I've been doing is I'm a senior advisor for Autodesk. Uh, and Autodesk is the big tech company that does uh, you know, CAD three-dimensional kind of software that all architects use, pretty much many in this construction industry, engineers to design parts, the whole manufacturing industry, and ultimately Hollywood. Actually, all, almost all films today use some uh, Autodesk software to actually create you know, spaceships that don't exist because three-dimensional models, they can do that in digital. Anyhow, I've been spending a lot of time with them for this last year uh, helping the CEO and the C-suite and the whole company think about the next 10 years, the challenge of the next 10 years. I mean, they're a $65 billion company. They're in 180 countries. Uh, and they are really concerned about what's happening and what, how the world's changing in the next 10 years. And so I, th I just delivered this, uh, a talk that kind of summed up my work with them just this week, actually. And I had a long conversation with the CEO about it. And I thought, as I was preparing for this, I thought, you know what? If it's good enough for us, it's good enough for you folks. So what I'm going to do is take really a brand new talk here. Uh, it's never been kind of delivered in a context like this. It's not exactly the same talk, but it's built on the same amount of work I've been doing here. Because what I'm going to talk to you about is, is essentially there is a collection, all, a lot of the systems that we've all been used to here for the last 40 years, most of us here from the demographics here, the world we came up in is actually fading away. And the world that we're going to have to shift to this decade is just starting to emerge. And getting across that divide there is going to take a paradigm shift from the way we thought the world worked and the subsystems in that world worked to the kind of new paradigm of how this new world is going to work and how those subsystems are going to work. And it's going to be an interesting conversation because it's, uh, it's a very going to stretch because the strategies are going to change very dramatically, I think. And this is something I've already been working hard with Autodesk on, and I'm going to actually give you some insight into what we're learning here. So we have an ambitious agenda here. I'm going to tell you what I think is really going on in the world right now. And in short, I think we're in a, a world historical shift between two different eras. And I think it's going to be remembered in history for a long time to come. That's a big enough story to tell. The second thing is I'm going to tell you what I think is probably coming. The technologies and the trends that are going to start really breaking hard here in this decade. And I'm going to tell you some of the critical, what they call critical uncertainties in the futures world, like things that I could go one way, could go another way. I'm going to give you a call and say, I think it's going this way. And, uh, and give you some insight into why. I'm going to tell you what's possible to achieve. What's interesting about this is it, it actually a lot of the things that are developing here have a lot of positive ramifications. In fact, we could solve many of the challenges that's timing us right now, might be able to get solved in ways that we're not really anticipating in the next 10 years. And ultimately, I'm going to tell you what you can do, uh, not in specific ways, but give you a sense of like, if I were you, what you'd do. And this is, again, what I was doing with, with Autodesk in a version of this thing. There's a lot to be said. There's a lot to move through. I'm going to move very fast, connect the dots and uh, give you a sense of what's happening here. So follow along for this ride. Some of it might, you take what I, take, some of it might be controversial, some of it might be provocative, but I'm gonna give you a shot at this and you can kind of take your own judgment of like, what do you think this is actually playing out? Now I'm gonna start here with, I don't know if anyone out there is watching the new Apple series foundation, the Apple TV series, but this is a found, the foundation was essentially the iconic sci-fi trilogy from Isaac Asimov, it was written in the 50s. And it has never been attempted in film or TV until now, until Apple's attempting this thing. So it's really interesting. So that alone is an interesting thing. But what's interesting for you folks here, and what I've been thinking about a lot, is Isaac Asimov, in the beginning of the computer age, we just had started with mainframe computers, the beginning of the information age, we just started to kind of get data collected digitally. 
He envisioned a time far in the future, this series takes place literally far in the future, thousands of years in the future, where we would have so much information, so much data, and we would have what he called math tools, essentially algorithms, that would be able to parse all that data in ways that we could predict the future. And this guy here, Harry Selden, is the guy with the math breakthroughs that understands what's happening in the future, and that's what drives the whole series and the whole, which could, could go on. So anyhow, I won't give you away what, what happens when he starts to predict the future here. But what's interesting about this is this world he envisioned far in the future is actually kind of happening in some respects. There is a lot, the amount of data we're getting here and the amount of information that I'm going to touch on actually even today it gives us insight in the future that we never would have thought about before. And so for again, I'll give you just one example. You guys are all tech folks, but just to remind you, we're all used to these kind of the, up to the terabytes. We're going into petabytes, exabytes, and I want to get to zettabytes here. So just keep adding zeros there. So here's one way to think about this is from the beginning of human history, what, literally 8,000 BC when we first started getting, capturing information on clay tablets, all the way to the beginning of this century, the 20, let's say 2003, all human beings created five exabytes. That's not the lower run, the one up from that. Five exabytes of data. We are now cranking out five exabytes of data every two days, and the world's information is doubling. This has all happened in the last 20 years because we're digitizing everything, and everything's being captured, and everything's starting to scale, and we're starting to hit this Moore's Law doubling every two uh, years. So the world is doubling. Now, so what happens with that is right by now, and I had to shrink the scale there, we're now up to basically 60 zettabytes of data. And in, this thing is continuing to double. Just by, in the next five years, we're expected to get to ah, close to, they think, something close to 175 zettabytes of data. And after that, it's going to go up another way. And then it's going to be up in the roof here. And then it's going to be through a floor. And then it's going to be two floors. And you know how exponential growth goes. So we have a shitload of data now in ways that we, no one could have actually ever imagined. The second thing which is interesting is we have figured out tools to parse that data to understand and get insights of the future in ways that we would, back in the 1950s we had no concept of how to do. Now here, if there is one character, the Harry Seldon character, which was fictional, today in the future it's a guy named Stuart Brand. Uh, Stuart Brand has actually created a thing called the Long Now Foundation, not literally because of the, the other thing. But Stuart is uh, essentially the guy who has collected the, an amazing crew of people thinking about systematically about the future. And he was a founder of this GBN, Global Business Network, that he had mentioned I worked with. I worked very closely with Stuart for many years. Uh, how to use tools to actually use, really get a better understanding of what's coming in the future. And this was Global Business Network as a pioneering outfit. Uh, he did that. He later went on to create this Long Now Foundation. Well, with Long Now, I am actually now hosting these civilization salons, we call them, which is essentially what my previous company did, was bringing people from all over the world, experts from all kinds of places. I mean, actually, some of these people, like Paul Romer, the last guy in my last roundtable was uh, the Nobel laureate from, in economics from 2018. That's Paul Romer. The guy in the bottom there, Vitalik Buterin, is the founder of Ethereum. I mean, I'm having this incredibly high-quality conversations with folks about the next 25 years is what we're doing through long now. But it's actually giving me insights into the next 10 years that I'm going to have to share with you today. And then again, like I say, with Autodesk, I've been actually looking at all the fields outside. This is what Strategic Foresight does, is it looks at the fields outside of your industry, your tech world, at the things that are going to impact your world. And so things that are happening in China, things that are happening in economics, things like this are all going to hit business. And so if you're a savvy business person, you want to wrap your head around what is actually happening. And that's what I was doing with Autodesk. I'm going to do it with you today. Well, in short, everybody here in this audience, we grew up, came of age, developed our experience in our industries in a world that really was pretty stable for the last 40 years and made sense. We had this meta challenge of, let's say, terrorism. Was if you had to think of the one thing the world was grappling with. We were based on energy was carbon. We had our transportation was the internal combustion engine, fed by that carbon. We had a culture that was very boomer-centric. Partly because of the boomers, we had the politics that was more conservative for those, pretty stable for those 40 years. Economics was the private sector led. We unleashed the private sector. Uh, capitalism was maximized shareholder value. We had our work was physical. We came to downtowns. We were all, everyone trooped in every week. Production was industrial. Ultimately, obsession of geopolitics of the Middle East because we had to defend the oil to actually get, feed the transportation to get the whole system working. This way to think about this is this is a coherent system, a whole paradigm of how that worked, all the subsystems, how they worked. What's really fascinating is I would say 
we got to start thinking that that era is over. That's an old system that we, it's starting to fall apart. And actually, we're going to start shifting from it very quickly here. Now, what is going to replace it if you take every single one of those categories is being superseded by another challenge? So I would say the next, in this 10 years here, and continuing on board, the big challenge is going to be climate change. The whole energy sector is trying to move to clean energy. We've got transportation is trying to go electric. We've got basically the culture is much more millennial centric, the millennial generation. It, actually, the politics, and this can get controversial, but I'll lay it out here, is going to move more progressive, probably, away from the conservative thing. Economics is going to be driven more by public sector investments. We're already seeing it with the infrastructure bill. Capitalism is going to be trying to deal with all stakeholders in new ways. We're going to have work is going to be increasingly virtual, not totally virtual, but it's going to be much more like uh, allow that. Production is going to be more biological. We're literally going to start engineering living things. I'll get into that a little bit in the tech stuff. And geopolitics is going to be Asia oriented with China, India, and basically the, the world, the bulk of the world's planet which is hugely important for climate change. This is a very different world that's over there. Every one of those categories. And that chasm right there is the next 10 years. And what, this has huge implications on strategy at all kinds of letter, levels. And for if you're a CEO, i.e. like Autodesk, or you guys, senior execs or whatever in your, your industries, you've got to navigate a very different world. Very challenging. Uh, situation here. Now, I'm going to give you a couple things here before we go through some of the data here to remind how do you know this is happening? Well, one thing is you've all probably seen this because this is a tech audience, uh, the technology adoption curve of how every technology starts out slow, moves up the chain into the early and late majorities and ultimately get all the laggards. Now, we've seen this a million times. The key thing is that tipping point is when does it tip? Because the thing before that tipping point looks, eh, maybe it's working, solar's so-so, whatever, this internet's not a big deal, oh, mobile phones will be fine, but not a big deal. And then once it goes, hits that tipping point, boosh, the whole thing's different, and then it changes. This happens not just with technology, with trends, same thing. Well, you know, everything's fine, 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 with, you know, say, women's rights, and all of a sudden you get Me Too, boom, the whole thing shifts, and people start changing their attitudes towards women, and things like that. So anyhow, this is what I mean. So that's the second thing you got to understand is paradigm shifts. People will hold on to the, long, the old paradigm, the desktop computer, whatever it is, uh, until they have to do the internet thing, right? They'll hang on to the world that works, because it's coherent, they don't want to change, all that kind of stuff. Then something new will happen there, and they'll say, huh, that is interesting. But it's not that interesting to make you shift. You got to get a critical mass of people thinking, this is really interesting. And then all of a sudden, you go, boom, boom the new paradigm shifts. And again, this happens with all technologies like that. It's like, well, that was that cool little Uber thing. And then, oh, more Ubers are pretty cool. And then, boom, the whole move, everyone's an Uber. And the taxis are sitting there in that little gray hole there, uh, that, that, the old, that old world there. Anyhow, the thing is, it happens all the time. And this is what I'm talking about. We got a ton of these we're shifting into here. Now, one is around climate. And this can get controversial. I've been talking to business audiences for 20 years. But um, I, I do want to lay out the facts. You cannot talk about the future without talking about this. And even your own personal attitudes towards this, you got to just suspend disbelief here, or at least hear me out here. Because this is going to drive a lot of what happens, certainly in the next 10 years, but even beyond that. This is just from a fact. You talk about information. We now have information that's good. This is the amount of carbon that humans have put into the uh, atmosphere from the time of Jesus, like two, it zero, for the last 2,000 years, and that thing that starts spiking is the Industrial Revolution, right? So that starts going through the roof, and that is going straight up the century right now. It's not slowing down. That's what everyone's kind of talking about. But it is even crazier than that. This is essentially, if you go back, and because we can go to ice core samples and all kinds of stuff now, you go back 400,000 years through all those little blips are ice ages, where carbon did go up and down depending on how hot the planet was and how cold the planet was. Human beings, Homo sapiens, don't appear till 200,000. Our species didn't exist till 200,000 years ago. And then that, all of a sudden with that Industrial Revolution, we go, whoop, that's carbon. Human beings have never lived in a world with this much carbon and the planet this hot going up. And look at that trend, how that's going. That's going up. This is why you're watching, everybody was just over in Glasgow. We are, everyone's trying to figure out how do we bring that carbon down? 
and how do we do it in a way that can bring it through the end of the planet, just so that we can stabilize this climate, because if it just keeps going up, it's going to, we're just beginning to see the beginnings of the repercussions of things. So again, this is a huge thing that's going on there. Now luckily, and you're talking about your tech crew, but there's t other technologies that is amazingly going through what the information technology worldwide. Clean technology, it is, if you were to look last decade in the 2010s here, it was not clear. Were we gonna get to some kind of clean energy or was it, are we gonna stick with carbon? And we, and we did stick with carbon until, but now this decade, this is tipped. And it is tipped, I think, so far that we are now making the shift fully to a clean energy economy in a way that's probably not going to stop. Um, one of the re what happened, the technology went through the same drop, dramatic drops in costs that the microchip went through, same thing. The solar chip cell went through the same thing. The same thing started. It started up, the ramping up of... Uh, Solar started going, oh my God, here we are. In uh, global growth here is now up to, uh, oh sorry, about 700, oh, we just saw that. Anyhow, it's growing up, but this, well, let me just get that back faster. Uh, the, uh, the growth of solar is now just took off, that little hockey stick thing, boom, and it's just gonna keep going here. Uh, what is now hitting is the logarithmic doubling, which is what that doubling of the data was doing. It is now doing that for the last 20 years with solar. And we are now on a roll with solar. And so here are some projections. These are credible projections. Just in the United States, by the way, this is essentially the adoption of solar energy to get to 100% clean energy off our electricity grid by 2035, which the Biden administration is committed to, which is that's the blue line. That was the old projection of what we thought we'd be on and just naturally going. But with stimulus and various things like that, you can actually see this thing going. So anyhow, that's happened with energy. Electric cars, same thing. Last decade, if you would have looked at this and said, hey, you know, is the, trans is the whole, uh, all cars going to go electric or not? It wasn't going to happen, right? Last decade. This decade, boom, it has happened. That thing has gone. And it's luckily because of Elon Musk and, and Tesla that really did it. And so what happened is we did in the last decade, the drop of price of battery packs, lithium batteries, just went dramatically down. Uh, through a bunch of breakthroughs, but the tech, tech, classic tech thing. It's expected to go t three to five times cheaper. Electric cars will be cheaper than internal combustion. This decade, they're thinking within the next two or three years this will happen. And so what's happening now is you're watching the ramping up of electric vehicle sales. It's now up to about, this was, act, that was eight million, it's actually nine million. It's, it's about 10% of all new car sales now globally are uh, electric. Uh, and it's just starting to chart out. So if you look out 20 years here, which is this data, credible extension, uh, you're, gonna, you're watching how electric and the hybrid, which is half electric, is essentially going to phase out internal combustion within the next 20 years. And again, this isn't crazy folks talking about this. This is uh, Bloomberg, actually. Uh, they have a special unit that's just focused right on, on economics. Uh, energy, the Bloomberg Energy Unit is basically laying this out. It's just probably a, a good call. Um, the wild card in the next 10 years is will, in fact, we get autonomous vehicles? And this one, uh, I'm not so sure about, uh, and that because it has a lot of things to do with this. Um, but I do think it's tipping. I'm not sure how fully it'll happen this, this decade, but it's certainly going to make advances this decade. But I think it actually could go. And here's the reason why. This whole supply chain craziness that we've been seeing here, uh, I just did a talk like this down in Houston to a trucking company and all their clients from the kind of region down there. And they were telling me the inside story of what's going on oop, in transportation, which is nobody wants to drive a truck. All the boomers have retired, are retiring, and then none of the young people. You cannot get a young person to say, hey, here's a job. You can basically be on the road all the time, away from your friends, family, kids, miss all the soccer games, and you know, this is a great career. Who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that, right? And so they can't fill the trucks. So that's what's going on with these backups going out here. So I think what's happening, this is essentially a projection, this was before the pandemic, of essentially the rollout of autonomous trucking, which will lead the way here. Well, probably on interstates first, not kind of back and through kind of alleys and urban centers. Humans will probably do that. But essentially, this is the expansion globally of what they think is going to be trucking. And I think given what's happening around this sna snafu right now, I think this is going to accelerate. And so I think it's actually very possible that we'll see really quite a big shift into autonomous vehicles, which will restructure cities in very interesting ways. Um, because people can share these cars, it'll just keep going all day, just all through, shuttling people all over the place. Anyhow, that's a whole other story about transportation. The critical uncertainties in this space, I will say, is 
Will we get a handle on climate change? Meaning, will it, we'll actually we start to like think we can handle this, or are we going to lose control? The key data here, I don't know if you want to go this deep into it, but it's an important metric to watch for, is we have to take $4 trillion globally every year in new money into the climate-related investments, clean energy, anything sustainable, all that kind of stuff. We're at about, we're still under a trillion, but it's getting close to a trillion now. And the interesting thing is, I think, from my kind of analysis, that the global finance world has tipped, meaning it's actually moving. The smart money is moving here. I'll give you one example of how this is. If you just take these last two years, which ended at the end of 20, 2020, which did include the pandemic, all the top, the leading clean energy stocks, they had started those years with in the little dotted lines. They have all grown, and all those oil ma uh, majors, which are the, 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 the in, in the carbon world, essentially the most valuable companies in the carbon world, all of them have shrunk. They started with the with the dotted line and are shrinking. And I think what's coming now is I think the idea of smart money is starting to move, and people are starting to think, huh, this is, if we're going to, in the future, which is where the stock markets go, is essentially is starting to shift. And look at Tesla. It's a trillion-dollar company now. It's up there with, I'll get to that in a minute here. Now, this is another to, no, no, really, to talk about usually in business audiences, but I'm going to deal with this with, in as neutral way as I can. Because I don't think you can understand this next 10 years unless you understand something what's going on with politics here. And it's, it's a difficult thing to think about, but I think, uh, to be honest, and I know business audiences want to see what is really going on in this country and why are things happening the way they're happening. And so I'm going to give you one thing that I think you have to understand about the demographic shift that's happening in this country and how it's driving politics and will drive politics. So here is essentially a snapshot of the United States population as of 2020. And each of those colors is a different generation, which you're probably familiar with. And down there, you can see the ages, and you can see how many people in each generation. So right there um, is essentially the working age people. Those are the people, your customers, that's your workers, that's them. The baby boomers, which have been driving everything, there was a huge you know, baby boom, was the huge baby boom that structured politics and everything, work, life, everything, for the last 40 years. Half of them are retired now, and many of them are dying off. Those, the reason that's going down is people are dying you know, uh, in their 70s and whatever, and they're playing itself out here. You just go out 30, 10 years to 2030, and this is that picture. All baby boomers are retired or gone, you know, literally fading out there. And you are dominated. American culture is dominated by the millennials and Gen Z. Gen Z, the next generation after them, they are very aligned in all their values about, hey, they're concerned for climate change and Black Lives Matter and you know, the role of women and all these issues that you're seeing breaking out socially. Um, that, they're a super alignment of two generations. That, that's a huge thing. Gen X, a lot of you are Gen Xers here, it's just a smaller generation. It was, it was so, so you don't have the same weight in terms of forcing where the culture is going to go. And if you just keep playing these numbers out, of course, uh, you know, by 2040, the, the world is the millennial Gen Z, and that's within your guys' careers here, potentially. And, uh, you know, by 2050, um, we don't know what's coming behind them, but it'll be the kids of these two generations. So anyhow, it's a, but this is inexorable. This is happening. This isn't like, oh, what's going to happen? Now, this one is another fascinating one. It is also controversial, but let's look at the facts of what's going on in this country. This is essentially the levels of immigration <coughs> into the United States from the early part of the century, which the century meaning the 1900s, uh, uh, the 20th century, uh, through the, the last uh, 40 years. And so what happened, basically, starting in Iraq, 1980, the immigration levels started coming back up to the level they were in terms of percentages in the great immigration influx of the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and the Eastern Europeans are now coming from all over the world, Latin America, Asia, what have you. So we had this kind of comparable uh, rise. Now that has turned into, because the country's a lot bigger, the actual numbers of those first, uh, first generation immigrants was much bigger. But of course, the country's much bigger. But anyhow, that's something to see. And so what has happened, and this is based on US census numbers, this is not illegal immigration, that kind of stuff. This is essentially, as the amount of people of color come up, the amount of white people come down, that's American 2020. By 2045, they're thinking even 44, white people will be a minority in the whole of the United States. But right now, in California, 
uh, for example, it's a white star minority. It's not that dramatically different, but in terms of it does impact the politics. It does impact uh, the culture and many other things, too, that you just got to think through. So one of the things I think is going to happen this decade, after 40 years of a kind of stable politics of what kind of worked, whether you're a Dem or, or a Republican, you still were working in a more conservative framework, this is, I think, going to tip towards an era where essentially more government intervention uh, in ways as opposed to more market. These are the kind of swings in the pendulum swings of major pendulum swings of politics. And I think this is tips. And I'll give you a good example of it. And so when you do that tip towards more progressive politics, as they say, and don't think of the far left kind of idea of that, just like you don't think of the far right craziness and conservatives. But in general, what happens, you tend to have more concern for the middle class and workers. You tend to be more, uh, use the public sector more to drive the economy. You tend to be more worried about equality than freedom to do whatever you want to do. That thing, I think, is tipped. And so a bigger way to think about it in terms of American history is that kind of politics is what happened off the Great War and the Great Boom. It happened in the United States. It happened in Europe with the building of the welfare states. It happened for us, the Great Society, all that kind of stuff. Then, starting in the 80s, around the world, it shifted to a more conservative era. That was Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and even Deng Xiaoping and China. The whole world kind of went more market-oriented for a run. It's just kind of been gone. And I'm just arguing and you don't have to take it, but I would say I would be prepared and think deeply about how politics is going to shift the other way. It's going to end, which is just, it naturally goes back. It goes way back. This goes through all American history, and it even goes through British history. You can see this yin and yang between these two different eras go back and forth, partly because it revitalizes it uh, way of going. Now, so I'm just going to point this out, and then I'm going to go on from politics. But I think you got to think, this is essentially the second Bush election, the Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight elections, or let's put it the other way. Democrats have won the popular vote of the presidential election in seven of the last elections. This one they didn't, and this was the high watermark in terms of what the Republicans uh, captured in terms of a, uh, uh, the popular vote and, and, and the Electoral College. It was very close. This was uh, Biden, this last election. The politics of California, I would say you guys here in Arizona have watched in the last 20 years how your politics has changed. California used to be a red state. It turned into a blue state, partly because of these trends. Now you're watching the whole Southwest is going in that direction. It's not just presidential politics. All your senators are now flipping that way, same too. And in fact, we're watching how it's hitting the deep South. This is not crazy to think that in this decade, you're going to have extremely competitive versions now in Texas, all kinds of stuff, partly because it's a younger demographic, it's all this more diversity, it's all these urban centers, it's all the stuff I'm laying out to you. Whether you like that or not, nobody's saying the opposite. Oh, California's going to turn red, or New York's going to turn red. This is the direction that's going. For better or worse, just putting it out there. And the final thing I will say is this, is follow the money. It's like, these are the counties that voted for Biden and those that voted for Bush in this last election, 70% of the GDP of the entire country was essentially in those counties that voted for Biden. It's very rare that that kind of economic power does, doesn't get its way <laughs> over time in any society, in any era of history. You d rarely get this imbalance going that doesn't rectify itself somehow. For better or worse, whatever your own politics is, I would just be aware of this next decade. Now, moving on to something less controversial is this economic, uh, let me just put this, this economic uh, paradigm shift. And my first book was called The Long Boom in the mid-90s. I basically called what was going to happen with the tech and economic boom of the next 25 years, which pretty much happened over the next, which we can go into in a minute. But I've studied a lot of what drives long economic booms. And mostly what it is is tech and technological, new technologies. Uh, the short answer is. And so what I'm saying is we spent the last decade worried about anemic American growth and will we ever get out of the Great Recession and will we ever get, I mean, everyone was worried about that, right? Worry about the other thing. We are now going into boom times. And you already started to see it. We can't get it. Inflation is coming back. All kinds of stuff is starting to happen here. Uh, can't get enough workers. Nobody can get enough workers. It's like that's boom stuff. That's not kind of, oh, my God, well, we can't grow. And here's the way to think about this because you're tech folks. 
is what I would say inexorable. So this is going to happen no matter what in the next 10 years here. We are going to watch an information technology boom. I'm going to give you a little more data on this in essentially a second phase of the information technology boom. If you thought we've been through a big boom, we're going to continue this boom. I'll give you that in a minute. I already walked through, we're going through a fundamental energy tech boom. And I'll tell you, if you can't make money in a world that's going from all carbon energies to as much as possible clean energies in the space of 10 to 20 to 30 years, that is going to be a crazy bonanza of economic development going on all over the planet. And the third one, which I'm also going to touch on, because is tech, is essentially biotech is going into boom. We have a triple whammy technology, world historical booms in biotech, energy tech, and the next phase of information tech. And that is going to drive crazy development of industries, all kinds of kinds of things. Now, here's one thing that you and the Infotech thing have got to wrap your heads around, is it's been amazing. We got about 60% of the planet is on the internet, right? And that only happened, by the way, since 2000, because when, you know, the late 90s, it was about 25 million. By, in 1995, when I wrote my first book, or was working on my first book, 25 million people were on the internet, and they were all Americans, 25 millions, right? And we're now up to about, uh, uh, four, uh, 60 percent of the world, like four billion people, right? But here's the thing: we still have half the, we still have three billion people to bring on, and this is not like how are we ever going to do that? Elon Musk, Starlink, all these kind of inter, uh, global kind of satellite situations. We are going to have every human on the planet will have a high bandwidth connection, without doubt, within the next 10 years here, and so we have half of Asia is still is not on the internet. Half of it are going to come in, two thirds of Africa and the Middle East are not on the internet. 40% of Latin America are not on the internet. And there's even some in Europe, mostly your Eastern Europe, that are on the internet. It's like, you got three billion more customers. Any of you that are in the cloud or that are kind of working on platforms that technically can go anywhere. Um, this is a crazy amount of growth that's gonna happen. Here's what even gets crazier, is AI. AI is now in a point now where it is gonna be ubiquitous through this decade here available to pretty much anybody. And here's the one thing that I think people are underestimating. Right in the world right now, native speakers of English are about 375 million, about 400 million people, million. And that's all Americans for sure. This is actually the languages in the world, right? And how many people speak the languages in the world. Now, not many people in this room can speak Chinese, Hindi, Arabic, right, probably. Every one of them who wants to play global, in the global business world has to learn English, right? So that's been essentially the paradigm of the last 20, uh, 40 years. Um, simultaneous language translation absolutely is going to be nuanced and ubiquitous in this decade, meaning anyone with any of those languages will be able to, in real time, understand with subtlety what you are saying on a video call, if you had an earbud and you're walking through a market in India, whatever. You're going to basically be, it's going to connect people in crazy ways. And that, in my opinion, a lot of what happens with innovation is cross-fertilization of ideas, of people, of perspectives. I think it's going to unleash a crazy amount of innovation. Now, that said is the politics influencing the economics of this thing is I think we're going to see more progressive taxation to deal with inequalities that have kind of mounted in the last era. I think we're going to see absolutely more um, corporate regulation, but you are businesses here. Uh, we're going to see more public investment. We're already starting to see the beginnings of it. The biggest investment in 70 years they just put in uh, with the, the infrastructure bill, but there's more to come. Again, booms can work in either economic environment. The greatest boom America has ever been through and the West has been through came after World War II, and that was an extremely progressive era. Uh, the tax rates on the rich were literally at 90%. Um, and you can actually boom in either case. It's just how do you structure the economy is kind of what happens. So keep an eye on that one. And then here's a couple of ones. I think this virtual work thing is really a surprise. Who would have thought, literally before the pandemic, that we essentially would, how many people would go virtual. And so I think what we're going to see is increasing virtual hybrid. I think it's going to, people are not going to abandon cities. People are going to want to be around people. Here we are here, music. And hey, as long as we're going to have, want to be attracted to sexual encounters, you're not going to be sitting in the mountains by yourself everywhere. I mean, I think humans will always come down from the mountains into the cities. Uh, it's uh, just how humans work. And it ain't going away. Uh, so anyhow, the point is, though, it will be this crazy hybrid thing, which is interesting. 
Here's one thing, since a lot of you might be working with millennials and Gen Zs. This, you look at those blue numbers there, particularly the hard blue. This is essentially, when asked, this is a recent survey here, a wide survey was respected. Um, if, you were, if your employer truly allowed you to work anywhere and still work, look at those younger generations, how many of them in the blue very likely to move to another city or even somewhat likely, and compared to, again, those older generations. In other, and we're watching, I'm sure every one of you probably has some version of this in your company. Um, but essentially, this is going to reshuffle the country in, in, in really interesting ways. But they'll move to cities. Let me put it this way. There won't be many people who move into the, the really the far, the far reaches. Another one that's going to flip this decade, as crazy as it sounds, because you guys here in Arizona have been on the front lines of this, last decade, immigration, whether to have it or if it's good or bad, whatever, it has been very contentious, obviously, in politics. That is going to tip. It's tipping, I think, and there's, a, there's some reasons for it. Partly it's going to be these labor shortages and all kinds of stuff are going to drive it economically. But look at these numbers. People don't realize this because it's the vocal extremes kind of are the ones that kind of get all the information. If you go back to the mid-90s and you polled all Americans, they thought that immigrants burdened the country. It was over 60% of Americans thought that, and only 30% thought they strengthened the country. Those have completely reversed. Now the, it's actually the opposite. If you really go to the average American, thinks over 60% of them think they're good for the country, and it's only a, a relatively vocal minority saying that they uh, burden the country. Again, think about generational change and things that are happening here. So I think, and, and with these labor pressures, it's going to push. Second thing is we've also, last decade, everyone was like, oh my God, the robots are going to take our jobs. It's like, what? everyone was worried about this whole thing. Well, let me tell you. Robots, it's going to be, adoption is going to come fast. And here's what it is. We spent the entire last decade thinking robots are going to take our jobs. They are going to save our asses. Let me tell you this. It, they're going to save our asses. I mentioned the trucker shortage is one example of it. There's going to be a ton of reasons for this. And one of the reasons is the amount of old people mounting, this is a projection out to 2060. Just, here's this is America. This is happening in every single, oops, sorry, every single uh, Western country uh, as, as a shortage of young people and uh, uh, workers. Japan is just cratering. Even China, I'll get to that right here. Uh, it's happening all over the world. We're going to need robots and we're going to need immigrants reshuffled to actually keep these economies booming. Oops, sorry. I'm getting a little out of my, uh, a little faster here. This is another shift that's going on. It has business implications, which is why I'm bringing it up here. Geopolitics shift. This, by the way, for anyone who's traveled to China, I was a foreign correspondent in China after Tiananmen Square. He mentioned that, one of my jobs before I moved on to the next jobs. Um, this, is, this, is a, this was, didn't exist when I was a, when I was a, a correspondent in uh, China after Tiananmen Square. This is right across the, from old Shanghai. Uh, that thing just went up overnight. China has been, now, the, our attitudes, though, of China are of the last 40 years are going through a fundamental change here. So let me talk about this, because it has implications on our economy. Um, we have assumed the Chinese economy is always going to boom. It's been booming for literally 30 years, right? In fact, this decade, it's, gonna, it's, it's already starting in a real struggle. And you can go way nuanced in that, but I will say they have a housing, what we had in America as a housing crisis an inf overinflated housing market, real estate market in 2007 that crashed. They have three times the exposure that has to kind of rectify itself. Anyhow, there's a bunch of, I can go into all kinds of details of this, but the idea of our old paradigm of what's going on in China is different now. Second thing is we thought it was liberalizing and becoming more integrated into the West and things like that. In fact, in recent years here, their current leader, Xi, is essentially getting more authoritarian. You're seeing things like in Hong Kong and all kinds of things cracking down. And the other thing is we thought, well, Chinese nationalism, how bad can it be? It is getting worse. Now, this is one that I wish was going the other way, and I actually was promoting that for most of my last 30 years, but I think, unfortunately, it's going that direction. The positive thing is the Chinese, just put this in perspective, while the last 30 years, what America was doing, what they were doing, they took 800 million peasants who were living on less than $2 a day in, the, in their rural areas, and brought them into the cities and got them into productive workers and middle class into the, onto the coast. That was a crazy amount 
of uh, transformation, which of course drove this crazy boom. So they took that red thing there, is essentially China pulling those people off the rural farms to drive their economy to the point where they basically are all now, they don't have anybody living on less than $2 a day. Um, it's an amazing thing. Now, here's the thing though. This is an age chart seen a different way. And by the way, ignore the green thing right now, that's India, but that red thing there is young people on the bottom, old people at the top, that is right now the Chinese economy, meaning they don't have enough workers under the old people who need to retire to keep that economy going. This is, they used to be what India is now, which we'll get to in a second, but essentially, and now they're in a very precarious place, um, which is why I think the authoritarian thing is happening, because. A lot of shit's gonna break loose over there. People are gonna be really freaking out. Um, anyhow, so this growth rate of China is gonna come down and it's gonna be more what developed countries are. A developed economy like ours, which is very advanced and all that kind of stuff, and Europe's like this, is about 2% a year. And they're gonna come through that. And they'll be like that by the end of the decade. But that's gonna cause a lot of trauma over there in that meantime. And so, this is what we gotta worry about. And this is the worst, this is the thing that bothers me the most, or worries me the most about what's going on in China, is I think we're, it's gonna, we're getting more contentious. I think, and this is the key one for the global economy, I think we're gonna see our economies become more separated, unfortunately, as opposed to more integrated. And I think it's not even, and, and we're, we're seeing this specter of Cold War coming. I don't think it'll go as far as any kind of battles or something. Uh, and our economies are way more integrated than we were with the Soviet Union. But anyhow, this is a very disturbing thing. And that middle one there, for anyone in global business, is going to fundamentally change the global supply chains. Is you're not gonna be able to have that kind of just-in-time manufacturing coming in from China. It's gonna morph into other parts of the world, uh, or it's gonna get localized. And that brings up India here quickly. Um, whether they're gonna rise or go, I think it's possible they have as many people as China and they have a much younger population, they're kind of gonna maybe step into the global uh, place that essentially China has been, and they also are, all speak English in many ways, uh, so they can integrate in the global economy despite the AI thing, it's much better if you actually fluently speak the language. Anyhow, this is a really interesting one to watch. And we're watching essentially the middle class of India, that's that orange thing there, and that's the middle class of China, which by the way is not American middle class, that's people who can have a scooter, a refrigerator, an air conditioner kind of thing. That's a global middle class. We're all rich in the global class. Anyhow, those are, it's charting off, and through that next decade up until 2035, they will essentially will have more and more middle class in um, India, uh, which will drive a lot of the global economy. And this is something that you should all think as business people globally, particularly with that porous internet that's out there. Right now on the planet, half the people on the planet are middle class or richer. I just mentioned what a middle class technically is in the global sense, that's that yellow one. We are all in that, even our working class kind of folks, uh, even poor, technically could be in the rich category there. Uh, but here's the thing, in 10 years it's projected we're gonna add about 1.7 billion people to that global middle class. And in fact, see those are the old ones, that little shadow there, we're growing there, we're shrinking the vulnerable, which is $10 a day or less, and the poor are $2 a day or less. Anyhow, we're shrinking them, we're boosting that middle class, and even the rich are, are expanding. It's a different world than the world we grew up thinking about, and it's one that we have to think finish. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one we gotta wrap our heads around. Now, I'm gonna end here by talking about some tech, back into your tech world thing. Because we are now moving into, what do you know? some tech and science paradigm shifts that you might not totally be wrapping your heads around or I, I will help kind of clear, clarify here, I think. One of the things that's really the most fundamental change in technology that's starting to happen is essentially producing in, in, from an industrial way, which we've been doing for 250 years since the Industrial Revolution, to a biological way, which is essentially engineering living things, plants, animals, and even humans. <laughs> and we are now, in the production side, let's set aside the human uh, engineering, but essentially I think it's tipping now to the biological. And I'll give you a couple examples of this that'll drive uh, quite interesting for people who don't kind of track the biotech world. The cost of, edit, uh, of essentially, uh, of, of getting a, a human genome uh, read, essentially, 
The first one, just in the year 2000, actually it was 2003, so let's say 20 years ago, it cost $2 billion to get one human's genome cracked. It is now less than 1,000 bucks, and it's on, well on its way to being about 100 bucks by the end of this decade. That is way faster than the cost savings and the, and the, uh, of what we've seen with uh, Moore's Law in the digital revolution. This is extraordinary, which is why we can track the virus mutating daily, because we just, uh, it's simple now to essentially crack, uh, track the, gene, the genome. The second thing that's happening is just like in the 90s when I was banging around the early Wired magazine and we were at the kind of ground zero for the tech world, um, there was a, there was, this was kind of what VC investment looked like in the 90s. You just kind of watched this building through the 90s until, wow, it started to take off in the froth of the, of the uh, dot-com boom and then, boom, took off the next decade, right? This is now the biotech VC money going uh, globally um, that has been happening last decade, which means it's going to kick off here this decade. See that 19, 2013? 2013 is when we figured out how to edit genes. We could read them. I was showing you how you read them. We figured out how to cheaply edit them in a thing called CRISPR, if you've seen that. That thing is what started to spark everybody now who realizes, huh, this thing called synthetic biology, engineering living things started to take off. So the question is, this decade, will we accept that or will there be some kind of backlash on it? I think it's going to be accepted partly because of pressures of climate change and other things. But it's interesting, some of the earliest things, like Europe had a huge reaction to GMO foods, genetically modified foods, back last decade, where all that blue is more than 50% of Europeans had high concerns about GMO foods and wouldn't let them in the countries, right? And essentially, that now, by the end of the decade, is down to less than, like, 10 to 30% now. So it's kind of say, like, okay, Genetically modified food is fine. Now, there's still an organic thing here and a lot of things going on, and this is not an easy thing, but I think what's going to happen is we're going to watch that happen. Here's the bellwether to watch. Cultured meats. So now we have a way, so those who haven't tracked it, is, uh, it's not this impossible burger, which is using plant food. We now know how to take a cell from a living thing like a cow, put it in a vat, give it the, directly the amino acids and the glucose and all the things that the cow would get through chewing hay over the course of years and drinking water and all that. We can do it fast in a vat to grow the exact same meat, exact same taste. It is meat. It's cell-based, but it's called cultured meat. Whether that gets adopted is a critical uncertainty of this decade. I think it's going to happen. Now, here is a good example of what happens. This is a reasonable projection that conventional meat for the next 40 years compared to cultured meat, cultured meat could be as high as 35% of all meat in just in the next 20 years, and that plant-based meat is essentially like impossible burgers, things like that. The reason is cattle is extremely bad for um, climate change. They, they emit methane. Uh, they're extremely inefficient way to produce meat. Um, I can give you the exact numbers on it, but it's, 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 it's a, it's, it, there's a lot of reasons to get off cattle particularly, but even all things. And so watch this take off. And it, if it goes that way, it can also go into materials, all kinds of things. Final thing I'm going to talk to you about is closer to hope for you guys is the infotech paradigm shifts. Our whole careers we spent, tech companies were thought about as awesome, and they were all, everybody loved tech companies, right? And all of a sudden, the last few years, it's like, oh my god, good guys are bad guys, right? I actually think we're going to go back to the good guys thing here. And I'll give you one example of what's happening here is um, this is globally and uh, throughout the United States, too, um, how much the technology tr sector was trusted, uh, which was huge. We were popular, huge. Everyone loved it. And until just about 2017, 2018, to that period, it started to plunge. What happened? Well, I will say this. If you go back, and this is a good reminder of how fast things change. You go back 10 years, this is the commanding heights of the global economy. This is the five most valuable companies in the world just 10 years ago, 2011. Um, and there are three oil companies. That far one is a Chinese bank. And of course, Apple had just cracked relative three years before the iPhone, right? End of the, 20th, end of, end of the 2020, the entire commanding heights are dominated by not, not just tech companies, West Coast tech companies in the United States in two cities, dominating the world, right? Um, and see that thing? It shifted to trillions. Those are gone from billions to trillions. So what's happened is we have 
freaked out the world of how fast these companies have grown in power. And so every time that happens, people are going to react. So the question is, how does the, uh, and, and of course, there's been also problems with social media and things like that. But in general, it's been a relatively recent phenomenon, mostly because it just came overnight. Startups went to these global powers overnight. So here's where I would watch, because it can infect all kind of technology companies. There is going to be a push here of how our companies going to, are we going to have a few big ones? Or are they going to be broken up and be smaller? Are they going to limit how many people, how many small companies you can buy? That might be a very possible thing this decade. Privacy, will it be more private oriented or more transparent? I think that's a genuinely open question, folks. I don't know which way it's going to go. And advertising or subscription is a big one for platforms. I don't know if you guys, it comes down to your kind of companies, but anyhow, watch for that to sort itself out very far. And to end the talk here, I'm going to just finish by saying, look it, we're in another historic juncture. The last, the closest thing we've come to it is essentially what happened around the Great Depression, World War II, and a great, the, what, the great boom that came off the rebuild of that place. And this is essentially Eisenhower. This is before D-Day. This is essentially the grand strategy room of essentially uh, uh, the Allies at that time. We're in a period of these kind of junctures. You have to think more like grand strategy. You have to think in big picture terms, what all the pieces are changing, how things are going. You have to take some early bets. You have incomplete information. You have to make your own strategy. Are we going to go fast? Are we going to go slow? Are we going to fast follow? Are we going to resist it? There's a lot of things. This is a time where we're going to have to really think hard about your own company's strategies. But I will tell you, we are going over, whether you like it or not, we're going from some, this world is going to be fading that we just talked about, that world that we're all used to for the last 40 years. This thing is going to emerge some way in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, it's going. And we are somehow going to have to, in this decade, navigate, get across that divide. And that is the challenge. For better or worse, I think what we're all facing here. But I will say this. In 50, 100, 500 years from now, People are going to look back and they're going to say, wow, that early part of the 21st century and even potentially this decade, that's when the world went fully digital. We went into essentially the whole planet got connected and AI came about. That was when the world went sustainable. We went to clean energies. We went to electric transportation. We went to sustainable biological engineering for sustainable everything. And they're going to look back and say, uh, you know, that's when the world went much more global and worked on a kind of planetary scale for the long run. And I would just say, uh, They'll look back and they'll say, oh my God, to have been in America in the early part of the 20th century, even in those 2020s, would have been an amazing time to have been alive. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and have a good conference. I think we hit the time. I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but do we? One or two questions of that. I don't want to keep you for the coffee break there. But does anyone have, there's a lot of info there, and I'm sure there's a lot of other points of view you can put in here. But anybody had something that they really needed to ask? Yeah. Um, All right, go yeah, ahead. What's your thoughts, you know, as you think about Elon and putting satellites up around the world, right, which is going to, for China, there's, you know, half of their country gets filtered content, and it's going to create this unfiltered content. I mean, how disruptive can that be? Good question. Everybody heard that, right? Um, you know, I'm telling you, it's going to be, like I say, there's a lot of crazy things that are going to happen in the next 10 years here. But that is something interesting. I mean, the Chinese have been able to deal with a bifurcated internet and still be pretty integrated into the global economy in ways that I didn't think was going to be possible um, in the 90s, the late 90s and early 2000s. They somehow managed it. So it's not clear to me if there's some kind of technological way that they'll be able to block the satellites or keep people kind of insulated or have their own kind of way to filter it or something. Or maybe they have such a kind of, uh, kind of, you know, kind of surveillance state that people, even with that access, would, be, would, would have to really be careful about how much they're going to flow. And you'll be able to monitor, oh, there's something coming from another stream from a satellite. Oh, that's not good. You're going to be visited by the, the flights. I don't want to be too ominous about China. Uh, it's a, very, a ton of subtlety around China, so it, it's very hard to just be one way or the other. But what I was trying to do provocatively is to show you that the things we thought about China are absolutely changing. How those really play out, um, it's possible. It could liberalize differently. It could be a different power shift. It could be the younger generations there, you know, insist change. Uh, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, you, that's combustible, because the more you get new information in there through those satellite systems, which, by the way, are operational, they're happening. I mean, that is, there's not like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could get satellites up there? It's like they're all over. 
So anyhow, good question. Any other quick questions here? And I'm going to be around in the coffee area, too, to, to talk. OK, here's the guy here. Oh, sorry, you got, you, oh, you got the mics? Yeah, sorry. Completely, do, do I need to repeat that? By name? Did everyone get that? Excuse me, sorry? You heard it? OK. Oh, you want to repeat it? OK, the quick repeat is uh, what happens with autonomous vehicles and will it change the, the nature of uh, ownership of cars and how that might cluster in neighborhoods or different configurations, which is a great question. That was one of the reasons I said that's a critical uncertainty that if it does go fully autonomous quicker than, 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 than a lot of people are thinking, um, that does change the game in very fundamental ways. And it changes what we think about as urban transportation, basically. And I think it would have strong reasons, strong reasons, to essentially have shared transport where um, not in the way that you're all sitting in the same kind of Uber, you know, going into town kind of thing, but it's that you wouldn't, put it this way, Everybody here's car is not, individual car, it's probably not used for 97% of the time you have it. It sits on a driveway, it sits in a parking lot next to work, it sits in a mall parking lot, whatever it is, it ain't being used, right? It makes insane amount of sense if you had an autonomous vehicle that you just call it whenever you want it, it's yours for that time, it's not like you gotta share it with everybody on the bus and whatever, it's like your car, you just call it up, you can do whatever you want, and then you get out and it goes to do the next guy next, next, you know, right close to them and take that person someplace. Those cars could circulate, a much smaller group of cars could circulate through an urban center and just do the exact same transportation kind of uh, thing that we essentially have on dramatically different ownership. And in fact, that is the radical kind of way to think about it, and that is a possible way that'll happen. The problem is how quickly will it be adapted that will say autonomous vehicles. I think the beginning will be trucking, because nobody's going to drive the trucks across the country, and somebody's got to do that, so it'll be the robots, right? And then they'll think, well, this looked pretty good with these robots, so they don't, not any crashes and whatever, it's all good. Then they'll go to this next side. It just might not happen this decade as much as I think, but uh, if it does, yeah, that would change the game a lot. One more question, Peter. One more here, yeah. Uh, yes, do you have any thoughts on the, um, the future of housing, and do you think what we're going through now is a blip, or do you think it's the beginning of a fundamental change of how people, how, how that's solved? The housing pressures. Yes, great question. Um, here's, here's my quick hand on this. Is, um, and, and so, so one of the things we watched in the last 20 years when the millennials essentially were young adults, they essentially crowded to the coastal super cities, basically, and it was fine. Four of them could live in an apartment, and it was all good, right? But they're now at the point where they're all starting to get to the point where they have to have families, and they're also starting to think economically, hey, I need some investment in housing, and those cities are so jammed and have been, you can't do housing. So you're watching an absolute happening. Is you're watching this diaspora of millennials off the coast moving into the heartland in all these different kind of cities. They're not moving to rural areas, they're moving to the cities there. Um, and for housing, primarily, but essentially it's reconfiguring a lot of stuff. The culture and the politics is going to happen there, uh, and it's going to disperse. This virtual world thing is essentially accelerating that. It's happening because you're going to watch very talented people. They don't have to be in the super top centers. They can be, and they don't have to be in Phoenix here. They could be, uh, you know... Des Moines or something, or even, you know, Fargo or something, you know, whatever. I mean, it's going to be a different thing. Um, so it is going to be, a, I think, a real game changer, I think, in the dispersion there. One thing that's clear is that everyone thinks, oh, it's an American thing. This is a global phenomenon. Every city around the world is, has costs going through the roof. It's a totally European thing. In fact, America is in better shape than a lot of cities in actually Canada, um, uh, Europe, for sure. It's happening globally. And so the thing is, uh, it's because we had to physically be together, and so people were going to, to these physical cities. Now it's going gonna, it's gonna to take pressure off, I think is interesting. Final thing I'll say about this is people think, oh, people are you know, leaving San Francisco, various things like that. Think about what's happening in America is 
San Francisco has now become a global city in the same way that London, Hong Kong, New York is now. And what has happened because of the centrality of the tech world and stuff, which isn't going to go away for a while, um, the actual core hub of it, um, it's bringing people in from all over the planet. And so every one of those cities, when I was a foreign correspondent in Asia, you can't get housing in Tokyo, you can't get housing in, in Hong Kong, you can't get housing in Beijing, you can't get housing in, in London, you can't get, I mean, it's like, it's like that's those global cities which are gonna be centuries like that, you know, they, 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 there's only so much space and everybody wants to go there. So we gotta rethink this. It's not like, oh, people are abandoning San Francisco or LA and these places there. No, those are becoming different kinds of co co uh, cities globally. And we're watching a redistribution through this country into kind of a, a different tiering, you could say, of, of, of uh, cities. One thing is for sure, it'll always be cities. I'm totally bullish on cities. And uh, I think it's great for places uh, all throughout this country. I think it's gonna be great. I think it's gonna see a real refurbishing of the heartland. It's gonna be great to see all this young energy, young families, new housing. And then the final thing is, because I was working with Autodesk, which deals a lot with the construction industry, the construction industry is going through a transformation in terms of how to build housing more efficiently. And there's a whole now thing of essentially factory made housing where we're essentially building units and almost and assembly lines almost and, and stacking them in these cities. And so you're going to watch a rebuilding of cities and much more efficient use of land and a much more um, cheaper way to raise housing. So the, over time, the housing prices will go down in the urban centers. And that's a long way to go. I'm keeping you from your coffee. Have a great coffee, so. But it was, it was a good. Yeah. Great questions, and I, I knew this would be thought-provoking. Um, we ran a little bit long, so I'm going to ask you to take a 14-minute break instead of a 15-minute break. So it's 9.16 if we could be back in here at 9.30 for our next presenter. Peter will be around if you want to chat with him during the break. Be sure and visit our sponsors' booths out there, including the Alzheimer's, and if you haven't got your golf shoes, now would be a good time to do that. <laughs>